Okay, so I'll start out easy. I'll start out really easy. So yeah, the 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 title I gave it was Lattice Models and Topological Order. When I made the title, I wasn't quite sure what precisely I would talk about. So hence, I put the and there, which means pretty much anything I say uh, would fit at least one or the other. Uh, probably a little bit more precisely in the title would be with, but I still will probably occasionally divert and do things that, strictly speaking, uh, don't have a lot to do with topological order. Um, so, in fact, in that spirit, let me start out with something really, really simple just to set uh, what's going on and to make sure everybody is on the same page. Uh, if, you, uh, if you've heard this before, uh, well, I apologize, but uh, I'll, I'll try to go through it quickly. And, but also, I'll do it in a little bit of a, maybe a slightly non-standard fashion. Okay, so... I'm going to do probably the basic model of many body physics. I should already. Well, already I'll trick you, so I'll try to, to keep you awake. All right, so any guesses what, what at least I would consider, especially from those of you who don't know, what, what, what you, do you think the basic model of many body physics should be? Any guesses? Sorry? Hubbard model. Oh, what? Oh, well, that's so not basic. That's so, so hard. That's the, that's the basic model maybe of strongly interacting with anybody physics. But yeah, you're in the right direction, yeah. I think, yeah, so those of you who know me, I'm kind of prejudiced, um, you know, and so I like spin systems. And we're, and we're going to talk about icing even starting today. We're going to talk about icing an awful lot. Um, yeah, that that probably I, on some most days of the week, I probably would agree that icing is the simplest, is the basic model of many body physics. But I decided today I was a little bit prejudiced, and probably others. All right, so uh, what's another any? Yeah, Kataev chain. Yeah, that's what I'm going to talk about today is Kataev chain. But uh, I'm going even everything everybody said is totally reasonable. This one is even simpler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Andrea knows me. It's all right. It's uh, free fermions. Come on. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I, even in my, you know, I love spin systems, but even I have to grudgingly admit, you know, come on, free fermions. If you're trying to describe a many body system, you probably should start with free fermions. So I'm going to start with free fermions. I'm, I, I mentioned I'm going to do it in a little bit of a different way than you might have seen it um, before. Uh, so anyway, so what, what, what are free fermions? So on every point, so free lattice, I should say, even more than free fermions, because in condensed matter physics, we, we like the lattice. It's often physical. Um, so free lattice fermions are the basic model of condensed matter physics. So we have, we put a two-state quantum system at every point of some lattice. Now, I'm well aware of what I said so far. This could be the icing model in any dimension, because the icing model is a two-state quantum system. But we're going to talk about something simpler. So the two states we'll call zero. And that just means what we'll mean by that is empty. And then we'll be filled. But that what that will mean is it's created by some operator. So this is on the jth site. And this is some operator, and I'll define its commutation relations. But in words, it's the operator that creates a free fermion, or creates a fermion, let's not say free, creates a fermion. 
at that point. I haven't said anything about free yet. And so that's my two-state quantum system. Now, th so, I, th so far I'm spinless, uh, so I guess if we want to do really basic, I can do spinless fermions, but everything I'm about to do, I can do spinless, spinful, whatever. So you can still write it in this fashion. And so the key thing about the CJ dagger creates a fermion. That's site J. And so the vacuum state is, I'll just call zero. So that means at every point in, along my lattice, I have an empty. And one thing to note, again, the language difference between condensed matter and particle physics. The particle physicists use the vacuum usually to mean the ground state of the system, not the empty state. So that's a really important distinction in condensed matter physics. Usually when we say the vacuum, we mean literally nothing. Um, the ground state of a quantum system is an interesting object. A lot of what we're, I'm going to say in these lectures is concerning the ground state, and there's a whole ton of physics in it, even in particle physics, but it's just a nomenclature. So a really important thing there. So it's not the ground state, as we'll see momentarily. So call that one. And this is the tensor product symbol. And then you have these operators that make particles. That's sort of obvious. But these operators, to make them fermions, so, so far I haven't said anything about fermions, obey the anti-commutator equals uh, no two there. So delta j dagger, uh, j prime, sorry. <laughs> primes. Okay? And so this just says that uh, no states are doubly occupied, so therefore, for example, C dagger J squared equals zero. You can't make two. So what could be simpler? Well, there's a lot of stuff that's simpler. So that uh, is simpler than this, because already this is an interacting system. I mean, this is, I, I called this free fermions, and there's a well-defined sense in which they are. But on the other hand, they do interact, because you can't have two on every site. That's an interaction. I don't know, you can call it, you can, you can dismiss it by calling it a statistical interaction like people do, as if it's somehow not an interaction, but it's interaction. Only one to a site. So the fermions know each other there, period. You built that in from the beginning when you imposed that thing. All right. So now let me... I said, uh, oh, I guess it's already been erased. I said this was a free system. So here's that, a generic Hamiltonian for a free fermion system. So far, I've just defined fermions. So the Hamilton will consider, well, in this language, looks like that. And I is not the uh, I is not the square root of minus one here. I is an index, and so you sum over all I and J, and these are called hopping fermions because what happens generically here, if I is different from J, you can you annihilate a fermion, and then you create. Sorry, that's annihilated J create at i. So again, what could be simpler? But there's a ton of physics already in just what I wrote down. OK. I hope, well, any questions, please feel free to interrupt. But I hope, uh, well, I hope I am not shocking anybody yet. All right, so now the way people solve this, and what people will usually do is, well, um, they'll say, well, we have some kind of translation invariant, so there's a unit cell of these, depending on what lattice you've chosen. 
and then you write down different ones inside your unit cell, and then you write Fourier transforms, and then you get some quadratic form, and then you diagonalize the quadratic form, and it's all good, and it's all anything, but you don't really need to do that. This model is solvable for any Tij that I want. The only condition is I need the Tij be symmetric so that H is Hermitian. So, I mean, all that's good, and for lots of times you do have translation invariance, so you might as well exploit it. And of course, what I'm about to tell you is very simple to do if you have translation invariance, but let's just do the very general thing, because it's good to know. And you can avoid you know, confusing matters, I think, if you do it this way. All right, sorry for this. Okay, so let's solve this. And the trick is the following. The key observation that lets you solve this and not mess around with uh, Fourier transforms, they'll come at the end if, if that's the way you like it, is to make one observation, is that if you commute a fermion bilinear, like this is, so the key property of this Hamiltonian, what makes it free, You've got two fermions there. If you commute a fermion bilinear with something that's linear, you get a linear back. And we'll see in a minute that that statement alone is just incredibly powerful and why it lets us solve the whole model. So let's, uh, let me be precise here. So if I have some CI dagger CJ, okay. and then I commute it with some, say, C dagger L, just for some L, well, what do you get using the anti-commutation relation I just wrote down? Oh, right, so so the point is, these guys always, uh, these guys don't, these guys anti-commute unless they're the same. If they're the same, you get them in the reverse order, um, plus one. The reverse order has a minus sign, but that doesn't matter because then the C dagger kills it and you just get left with that. So is that clear? You want me to write out the intermediate step? Don't be shy. So, well, so I said that in words. Okay, but that can be. Am I supposed? I'm supposed to give exercise or something. So that's exercise zero. If that's not totally obvious to you, just go. And you're embarrassed to admit it in public. Just go back to the privacy of your own home and work that commutator out. If it's obvious to you, then then fine. <laughs> the problem is if it's obvious to you, but then you don't understand it. But uh, that's why it's always good to work these things out just to make sure. Oh, okay. Yes. Which, uh, okay. Yeah, that would help. Yeah, this is better. Good. Okay, so, so now this statement is enough to just solve that Hamiltonian. Let's leave that Hamiltonian there because then if I now have this bilinear here, Yeah, that's, that's better, isn't it? And anti-commute it with some linear combination of these guys. Well, then I, with all these deltas, I get out some linear combination. Just to make sure I write it out correctly. Sum on ij, tij, aj, cj delta. Right. No, absolutely. Uh, yeah, this is just one example. That's absolutely right. So if I did the same thing, I would get exactly the same. You might get a minus sign, I think, 
you would get a minus sign, but absolutely. Um, another way if you want to do it is just take the Hermitian conjugate of this whole thing, right? Because this is, uh, well, yeah, this is Hermitian, and then that is, and same with that. So, but that's right. Maybe you get both. But it's still linear is the key. Okay, good. So now if you look at this here, well, this is just matrix multiplication, right? So if this matrix is some matrix Tij, right? This is T11, T12, T21, which is equal to T12, dot, dot, dot. And then the A's are just form some vector there, right? A1, A2. Wait, did I? Well, T1 symmetric works, but let me, uh, sorry. What I said was fine, T1 symmetric, but of course, we don't have to even make it real, so let me be a little bit more general. So let's just make T1 permission. I should have said symmetric and real, so I guess that was wrong. Symmetric, it could have been symmetric and real. Already one mistake. But OK, so here we've got this multiplied by that. And if you wish, you can then put the Cs here, C1 dagger, C2 dagger, and so forth. So whenever in physics you see a matrix, what do you do? Well, I should say a Hermitian matrix, at least. What? Well, we diagonalize it, right? I mean, you know, this is when God hands you a matrix. I mean, you know, we, you, you diagonalize if you can. Well, and I haven't told you what T is, so obviously you can't diagonalize it, but we can... We can say we diagonalized it. And uh, one thing I know, because I said T was Hermitian, um, is that it has the same number of eigenvalues as eigenvectors, by the way. This is always an important thing to remember in physics. You know, sometimes you do come across, um, you know, matrices that aren't Hermitian. And, you know, shockingly, they don't always have eigenvalues and eigenvectors. I remember when I first learned this as an adult, you know, you, you just, they just don't. I mean, even matrices with determinant one um, don't have necessarily uh, n by n matrices do not have necessarily n eigenvectors. But Hermitian matrices do. So we can diagonalize that. And so let's find the eigenvectors of this thing. All right, so just that one. So we, f we find the eigenvectors of this matrix Tij. which just look like the following, I guess, Tij, sum of j. And the way I'm going to write it, so the eigenvectors are mu j, and I'm going to label them by k. So k is the label. That's what. And then that will give you some eigenvalue. What did I call the eigenvalues? I wanted to call them 2 epsilon. So if just for conventional reasons, I put a 2 there, and I call that some epsilon sub k. That's the eigenvalue, and I get mu sub j k again. So that's just a statement about what the eigenvalues of the models are. But that statement alone is enough to determine every single energy level in this entire model. The entire spectrum is now known if you know simply those numbers. All right, so let me show you how that goes. Um, I write, well, let's uh, close this out. So I'm just going to take now this linear combination that I just erased. And we'll define a linear combination. We'll call it psi of k. And it's just this linear combination. Oh, sorry, mu called it. Sum on j, mu k, j, c dagger. J. All right. And then you just plug that back in. And then you find now. Use the equation I just derived, just erased, just derived, erased, derived, then erased, and then you find 
the following. In fact, let me call that psi dagger because I put a C dagger there, sorry. And because I define that funny two there for reasons that may be apparent soon, you get that back. So, oops, and I'm putting K in parentheses. Okay, so what it says is you commute H with the psi dagger, you get psi dagger back times that number. That's just a direct consequence of that relation there. And again, if, that, if I, I skip this algebra step, if, if that's not obvious, go home and check it. It's just a few lines once you get it straight. Okay, so these things are what we would call in quantum mechanics raising operators. So if you have some eigenstate, if, if the state, uh, let's call it uh, E, it obeys, I'll just write it out. Well then, H psi dagger, okay, equals epsilon e plus 2 epsilon k e or very important uh, sorry or psi just annihilates the state Either or, so it acts on a given eigenstate, either it kills it or it shifts it by energy, and that follows directly from this. But I'm not talking about the raising and lowering operator, some silly little quantum two-state system like you probably learned in quantum mechanics. I hope you learned in quantum mechanics. I'm talking about the entire system. This shifts the energy by this value 2k, 2 epsilon k, for the entire system. So now we're almost to proving the statement I made a little while ago. I said this gives you all the entire energy spectrum of the theory, but not quite. Um, we have to say one more thing before we, well, it does give the spectrum, but I have to say one more thing before that's true. You have to check um, what algebra these psi of k's do. Okay, so I have to take this combination. So let me take the anti-commutator psi of k, psi of k prime. Okay, I plug that in. And then I get up to factors of two, but I think I got them right. You get t. And so remember, k so far is just a label. So if you were doing Fourier transforms, it would be related to the momentum, et cetera. But right now, it's just a label. It labels the eigenvectors. And so anyone can say in words why I know that's true? How would I compute that? How would I show that? All right, makes sense to people? So when you have a Hermitian matrix, I've made an elaborate point of saying it has a bunch of eigenvectors. One of the things you know about eigenvectors, well, different eigenvalues are orthogonal. They're the same eigenvalue. They're not automatically, but you can always then orthogonalize them. Right? And so then you use that. So let me just write it out. Oh, that one. Since the proof is one line, you just use the fact that some j, j prime, mu j, k star, mu j prime, k prime, delta. You do the anti-commutator, you get delta j, j prime from the C's, and that just equals delta k, k prime because eigenvectors.
Okay, so different eigenvectors are orthogonal. And so, um, yeah, that's what I said for orthogonal and complete. Right, for a Hermitian matrix, they are complete. And also, to get this, I assume they're normalized. So I, I normalize them. So I guess that's up to the normalization. If you don't like normalizing things, just put your normalization factor. OK, so now what we have, because I keep emphasizing, is that the eigenvectors are, uh, excuse me, the eigenvectors are complete. And so there's then n of them. So for an n by n, uh, so let's think now, if there are n sites on my lattice, uh, do I know? Okay, everyone commit these things to memory. Um, if there are n sites on the lattice, okay, well then the Hamiltonian is 2 to the n by 2 to the n, or the tij, or I should say the t, is, is a 2n by 2n matrix. Oh, sorry, not t, t. <laughs> Excuse me. t is an n by n matrix. All right. The Hamiltonian, however, Right, is a 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix. Right, because there's, think about it, you've got n, you've got n sites, each is a two state system. So again, if I assume no symmetries of any sort, in principle, that Hamiltonian could be anything. Now, I assumed a particular Hamiltonian form. So I wrote this 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix. Um, in terms of an n by n matrix, but the Hamiltonian is a 2 n by 2 n matrix in general. All right, but see, now I diagonalize not the 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix, but I diagonalize the n by n matrix. It's a lot easier, right? You know, n can be big, but at least it's still a whole lot easier to diagonalize an n by n matrix than a 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix. So assuming you can do that, okay, you diagonalize this matrix. You, we have then n different raising operators. Psi k, dagger, and then n lowering operators, psi k. But this relationship is now important, right? It says that if you act with psi and psi dagger plus acting in the reverse order, I always get something. So I noted before, you know, there's this possibility the raising operator could annihilate a state. And indeed, that's always a possibility. But what this says is that if for a given k, They both can't annihilate it. So the importance of this statement that I just made is one of them can annihilate them. Maybe psi annihilates it, but then psi dagger can't. Because otherwise, this is just one, or the identity operator, if you wish. So both cannot annihilate. One of them, at least one. Maybe you can write a state that both don't annihilate. That's up to you. But at least one of them. Right. 
And so therefore, the states have to form pairs in eigenenergies. There has to be two states Minus epsilon. So this is why I stuck that 2 in when I defined the eigenvalues. There are, have to be two states. I didn't tell you what E was, but for every K, there have to be two states. So is that clear? Because one of them has to, you know, so one state say this is the one state that psi dagger does not annihilate. Well, then it'll give you that one. And if this is the one that... Uh, Psi dagger annihilates, then psi can't, so it has to give you that one. So they have to form these pairs. Is that clear? But we've got k of them. Sorry, we've got n of them, one for each k. So therefore, for the arguments I just gave, the energy has to be all the eigenvalues have to be of the form, well, plus or minus epsilon 1, plus or minus epsilon 2, plus or minus epsilon 3, all the way up to plus or minus epsilon n, and then maybe there's some constant there. Let, let me just call this, I'll just call it epsilon naught. I can't say that there's an overall, you can always add an overall constant to the Hamiltonian. But now let's count. Well, I have this choice of sign for every single epsilon. So thus there's two to the n different energies. So this is just. So there's two to the n different energies. Right. Well, I just said that the Hamiltonian, the thing I just erased, is a 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix. Well, I just found all the eigenvalues. So I just showed that these, are all, these all are eigenvalues. They must be eigenvalues for this statement to be true. Well, then there we go. So this is now a proof of the statement I just made. So, I mean, this has nothing whatsoever to do with Fourier transformation. It has nothing to do with translation invariance, nothing to do with any of that. It's a statement about free fermions. And that's the most completely arbitrary free fermion Hamiltonian. And so this, so I, I've never seen in the literature the definition of the word free. Um, I mean, you can define in field theories, you know, you say certain, make certain statements about correlation functions. There's, there's lots of notions of free, and they're all probably the same. Um, maybe even somebody's proved it, but I don't know. But this is my definition of free, is that the spectrum, oh, free fermion. So this is a free fermion spectrum. And the key thing, there's lots of models that aren't free where you can write the spectrum. Well, it may look like this. In other words, you may solve some equations and you get some expression for the energy that looks like this. But why this is free is because the values of the epsilon are just fixed for the whole problem. The, the values of the epsilon do not depend on the choice of the plus or minus. plus or minus. So if you, those of you familiar with the Beton sets, have you heard anything about the Beton sets this week? Heard, yeah, you've heard. You know, so the Beton sets will lend um, equations like this. If you look at the expressions for the energy coming in the Beton sets, you'll get expressions that are like this. But the catch is, if I change one of these signs, it corresponds to filling a state or leaving it empty, um, just like the raising and lowering operators. Um, well, then it will affect the other values of epsilon because you put a well, put a hole in the C or fill a hole in the C or whatever. So you change the other epsilons. And so that's the distinction. So that's not a free system. So it still looks like that. But this, we just determine the epsilons by diagonalizing that n by n matrix. And then we're done. Well, we're done. We've solved the entire spectrum of the problem. Good. Questions? 
So yeah, it's, it's I, I, I'm surprised, I'm, I'm sure some books write this out this way, I should say, um, for very specific 1D systems, this is explained the way I do it, in maybe a little different formal language, but um, I'm sure someone in the even older days did it this way, but at least the earliest thing I know about that talks about it, sorry, it's, it's Lieb. I think the order is Lieb, Schultz, and Mattis. So there's two Lieb, Schultz, and Mattis review articles. Um, and this is at least two, maybe there's even more. And this is the one, I think it's 61. It's in Annals of Physics. There's a later one on icing that I'll mention later. It's an appendix or something like that, they say this. So uh, I, again, I'm sure they didn't invent this particular thing, but at least that's the earliest reference I know about. And again, no, I emphasize, Nothing about translation variance, nothing about boundary conditions, nothing about that. All that's details of the T. They're often very interesting, as we'll see, details of the T. But to solve it, that's all you need. All you need is the eigenvalues of that matrix. Yeah. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah, because that's not, right. That, that's why people often don't do it this way, because you have to, right, it's not a priori. So the point is because I guess I've erased it, but the thing that I, I wrote psi k, psi k dagger plus psi dagger k. So, so psi, psi dagger. So this is the key relation. Well, one of the key relations. So this thing equals one or the identity operator. Okay, so that says acting on any state, right? Any state of the theory, forget eigenstates, anything like that. Well. Both psi dagger and psi cannot annihilate it, right? Because otherwise, this cannot be one. So therefore, well, at least one of them doesn't annihilate it. But then I showed you, because of the commutation relations of psi and psi dagger with the Hamiltonian, they shift the energy. If it, if it does not annihilate, it shifts the energy. So you know either, if, so given one eigenstate, well, then you act with psi, maybe psi annihilates it, but then psi dagger cannot annihilate it. So, then it will, so if you had some state with energy E, well, then it will give you a state with energy 2 epsilon k, by definition, because it satisfies that commutator. So they have to pair up like that. But this is true for every k. And so then, uh, yeah, then it's still here. Right, so then, then for every k, I get one of these pairs. I know there are eigenstates for every single pair. Right. Oh, well then, yeah, okay, so I didn't say that. I should have said one more thing. One more thing is, remember, I wrote down the fact that different Ks anti-commute. Okay, yeah, so I didn't say, I mean, this was implicit, but I, look, this is good for me to say it explicitly. Remember, the different size at different K, you know, they anti-commute. They pick up a minus sign. The minus sign doesn't really matter, but the point is, I can do this toggling back and forth. So if you wish, I have a bunch of energy levels. So I have these epsilon sub k, epsilon sub i, and I can, I can use psi 1 to move those up and down, but that doesn't change any of that. Right? And I can use psi 37, and it doesn't change. And that's the difference between this and the beta ansatz, right? Because there, if you act with 1, it will affect what's going on here. But so that's what I meant when I said the, it's independent of the choice of plus or minus signs. You act with any psi, and it, it doesn't affect the others. In a beta ansatz case, it will. And that's why, even though that formula naively works, the point is the epsilons will change because they interact. So good. No, no thank you for asking. That's, that's important. Good. Any more questions? All right, so now let's do a trivial example where we will do a Fourier transform, or, well, you'll see how it comes out. Yeah, that's good. I'll do, the, I'll do an example, and then uh, uh, 
we'll take a break. So the example, since most or perhaps all of these lectures will be in uh, one dimension. We'll see if, how far I get, if I get to two dimensions by the end. But anyway, so let's do a 1D hopping fermion. So let me write the Hamiltonian like this. So this is 1D hopping fermion. And let's just do nearest neighbor. And so I'm going to write H just by convention, put a minus sign there, minus T. Um, and let's, let's, let me write, T could be complex just for a moment. Let's keep it that way. So I'm writing like this. T C dagger C J plus one plus T star plus one dagger C J. Seems the Hermitian conjugate. And then let's add, we can add sort of a chemical potential thing here. And uh, I guess let's put periodic boundary conditions on it for the moment. So that C L plus one just means C one. So it can hop around the world. And a subtlety I'll note now for when we get to the icing model is these are periodic boundary conditions on the fermions. But when we do spins, periodic boundary conditions on fermions are not the same as periodic boundary conditions on spins, just as a note for the experts. People have already seen this before. Okay, so, oops, missed the parentheses. Anything else missed? Um, one thing to note, I might as well say it now, notice this thing just counts the number of fermions, right? Because if, this, if the site is uh, empty, well, this just annihilates it. But if the site is occupied, it annihilates and then recreates it. So this just counts, let's just call that F, that counts the number of fermions, and it's easy to check. Again, one of these simple exercises, if that's not obvious, is that F commutes with H. We're going to, when we get to icing again soon, or later today, uh, that's, cons uh, so F is conserved. In icing, that's not true. We'll see how that works. Uh, what I say? So it's a U1, if you wish, it's a U1 symmetry. And uh, what else do I want to say about that? I guess that's all. Oh, I mean, it's sort of obvious from this picture why there's a U1 symmetry, right? Because the fermions are just being annihilated and created, so therefore, uh, do you want me to stop now, or do you want me to? Oh, okay, good. Okay, let's say I was going to stop at ten-ish. Is that all right? Um, okay, so let's solve this. We we did it already. So let's write down this matrix uh, right now. So the matrix T I J I gave last time is just very simply the following. We have mu. T, T star, mu, T, T star. And then everything else is zero. So that's the matrix, T, I, J, that I just defined at the beginning. OK. So uh, what I showed you is you just have to look for the eigen vectors and eigenvalues of that matrix. Um, oh, yeah, one thing I left out. We have to, though, remember I made it periodic, so i got to put something way down here. I think that'll be T and that'll be T star, if I did it right. I don't think so. The way I defined it, no. I don't think so, because remember it was C, C dagger. I think it's okay. Oh, I put a minus. Oh, oh, minus on the muse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. 
good. Yeah, sorry. I thought on the T's. I was <laughs> because in the next example, they do appear. That's why. But yeah, right. Sorry. Thank you. Good. All right. So, uh, all right. What are the eigenvector? I mean, what, what's the form of the eigenvectors of a matrix that looks like that? Good thing to know. Yeah. Oh, minus sign for good. Oh, you're right. God, my homework. That's homework. Uh, right. Uh, what? We can rotate. I, I want the minus sign just to put band bottom at k equals zero, not pi. Is the only reason for this either. I think maybe that's the permanent homework project because don't uh, some people I have to give some homework to or something. Yeah. All right. The permanent homework assignment is find all the minus sign errors I make. <laughs> I will grade you well, uh, you know, if you if you find the other and yeah, you're allowed to give me them in real time. That's fine. I'll, I'll you get credit for that. I don't you have. <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't know most of your names, so it might be difficult. But whatever. Um, yeah. Okay. So all right, I, I said, how do you? All right, forget the signs, eigenvalues of. Uh, how do you, eigenvectors, what form eigenvectors that matrix? That's a useful general lesson. What's an on, give me an ansatz for the eigenvectors of that matrix. Yeah, for I already told you the hint, but what is, okay, right, good. For A, that's a key hint. Yeah, our power law, if you want to think of it that way, Fourier transform is kind of a power law, right? If I just write mu j, let's just write, let's make an ansatz mu j, right? Well, if I just write as a power law, so they're all equivalent to some constant, but I can always set a constant to be one because this is, uh, uh, you can always, eigenvectors are, well, you have to normalize them at the end. Well, why don't I just take, so that's why I said as a power law, and I'm just going to suggestively write the, the thing that's going to the power as e to the i k. But always, yeah, power law is the right thing to think here because, you know, when you have this form, well, you'll see, uh, maybe it'll be obvious when I write down what the equations are, why this is. And the reason why it's an e to the i k because I have this periodicity. And so I'm going to set e to the i k l equals 1 will turn out to be nice. So that, that's maybe a little because I know the answer, uh, I wrote it out. But on the other hand, let me, if once I write out what the eigenvector equations, it'll be kind of obvious why that they're of that formal. Well, so let's write one out. The first one's kind of weird, so let's write out the second one. So we have T star U1 plus, oh, I used mu twice, oh God. I'm so sorry. Uh, let's call this V's from now on since I called that, for the eigenvectors. I remember in before I used mu's and then I used it again as chemical potential. No, yeah, I even did it in my notes. Boy, that's embarrassing. Okay, so V is the eigenvector now that we're going to talk about, not mu, which I called it before. So we, won't do it. so we just multiply it out, T star V1 plus mu V2 plus T V3 has to equal, I put that silly t, that silly 2 there, equals v2. And why power law? You then see, ah, well, the catch is, look, notice there's v2s there, v2s there, that's a v3 and all that. But notice if I then set vj to be that, well, what do I get? I get e to the i k t star plus mu e to the 2 i k plus t e to the 3 i k equals 2 epsilon k e to the i, oh, sorry, 2 k. So you see now the pattern, the 2's kind of cancel, and now I can do this for any j. So let me, I know you're not supposed to do it by erasure, but if I put that j minus 1, j j plus 1, j. Well, then that's e to the i k j minus 1, 
e to the i k j e to the i k j plus one e to the i k j so now you see the comment that it's you super want powers because of course note i can then just get rid of the j's they all cancel and i want to leave that up there so sorry let's this right there. So we have for all k, sorry, for all j and all k, we just get t star e to the i k e to the minus i k plus mu plus t e to the i k equals 2 epsilon k. That's if I set e to the i k L equals 1, so that when you go around, you just get the same deal again. And again, if I screwed up a minus sign, figure it out and tell me. Because there's some subtleties at the end. You have to be a little careful. OK, so that's the trick. So now notice we, we, had, we had these equations for all j, but this one is independent of j, so you just have to solve this thing. So you're done. So we're done. Right, so we have then. So notice there's L values, the L solutions of this. So K is equal to two pi n over L for n some integer and then equals zero up to L minus one. All right, and then so that's n different val. Sorry, L different values what I was calling capital N generically before. So now we have, so then we get epsilon K equals mu over two. And I forgot the minus sign. The people, T cosine K. For that and for that. So we're done. We've just solved that system. We know every single eigenvalue of the energy by using the formula. Well, this one's pretty simple. We'll be just minus T cosine 2 pi Ni over L minus mu. Right, and then you just have the choice. Oh, sorry, plus or minus for that. Good. So we solved it. So the way people traditionally would do this, you would just write that on that Fourier transformation at the beginning, and then follow the same steps. But I think it's nicer to do it this way. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, sorry, I, uh, thank you, yeah, because the T star, uh, right, so it would be, yeah, yeah, sorry, I, I was, after the break, I was going to specialize to T uh, real, but, uh, right, so uh, minus T cosine K plus some phi where T equals absolute T in the I phi. Good, thank you. Yeah, so you see here all that does is shift the definition of K, so actually you can get rid of it by redefining K. But in general, that's not true, so thanks for reminding me. Yeah. Good, any other questions before we break? All right, break, what, what are we, 10 minutes? What, 10 minutes, 10 minutes or so? I reduced the problem of diagonalizing it 2 to the n by 3. Um, I, I, instead of diagonalizing h as a 2 to the l by 2 to the l matrix for the 1D case, well, I reduced this to diagonalizing an l by l matrix for this 1D case. And in the particular case 
of hopping, nearest neighbor hopping, computed the eigenvalues. And I guess I got epsilon k equals, I already forgot, minus t over cosine k. Let's take t real here. In this case, that's Okay, so that, that's what we got. And so now let's just talk about that a little, what that means. And um, so that means the energy is just the sum over all k of plus or minus epsilon k. And then I have the choice. All the energy levels are just specified by the choice by uh, L choices of plus or minus. So now we have to ask, so what's the ground state? Remember I made this point to say, you know, the vacuum means there's just no fermions, but that's definitely not the ground state here because um, no matter the sign, whatever the sign of epsilon, um, you, uh, whatever the sign of epsilon is, uh, some of them are going to be negative. And so the point is, well, then to ask, you know, what's the sign here? So let's, in fact, take um, uh, t. Well, let's first set, just to make it simple, let's set mu equals 0, t greater than 0. Well, I can plot this cosine 2k or minus cosine 2k. So then it'll look like if I can successfully draw a sine curve. I guess it'll look like that, right? And then keeps going. But the point is, remember, the k's only ran, well, the way I wrote it before, I think I wrote k between 0 and pi. Let me change my definition and let k run between minus pi and pi. Uh, sorry. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, uh, I didn't write down, I didn't define my axes, but yeah, maybe, I, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe, all right, uh, trying to keep you away. Um, I said I give, I'm giving out credit for minus sign errors, so all right, you just got some credit. That wasn't an error, though, I would, wouldn't give you credit for it. Um, okay, so... Right, so that looks like that, and you know, obviously cosine k keeps on going, but uh, I restrict it there, and I've shifted. That's called, if you want fancy words, that's the Brillouin zone, you know? So uh, condensed matter classes are often designed to frighten people, I think, because there's some macho culture that, you know, we're, we're tough people, we, uh, we go attack really difficult materials. So. Um, we're going to try and scare off unsuspecting graduate students. But so anyways, I, I digress. Um, so anyway, so th that's, the, that's the values that k takes on. So k is between minus pi and pi. And so then what happens is, again, for each of these values, we quantize them. Remember, k was equal to 2 pi n over l. And you have this choice for each of those values. If you make l big, um, well, let's go. So, uh, yeah, so I'll make a few general comments in there. So this sounds really simple. Um, you know, so we can, again, I can give it fancy names, the Brillouin zone, and then now let's find the Fermi surface, so let's set mu equals zero. Well, then what happens is all the epsilon k's that are negative, in the ground state we want so the lowest energy state in the ground state, we want to choose the plus sign 
for um, epsilon k less than 0 and minus sign for epsilon k greater than 0. So that's, um, and then that will give us the lowest energy, right? So in my conventions, that means the states um, with uh, T cosine K, I guess, what's my convention? Less than minus mu. and greater than minus mu are filled and then empty. And if I screwed up a minus sign, don't tell me. No. One of those is right. Did I exactly as is? I put that minus sign in the mu, which bothered. I shouldn't have put that, but anyway. I, get, I think that's right. And that's supposed to be a... And so that's why I said the ground state uh, has a bunch of states filled and a bunch of states empty. And so if mu equals zero, well, then half the states, well, actually, let's keep it in this picture. So all the states down here are the ones that are filled, the ones that are up here are empty. And if I shift mu, well, then I just get different filling. Now, one important thing about this is it is a gapless system. Uh, what do I want to erase? Let's leave that. Let's see. So what that means is if I look at an ener there exists excited states. So we have an energy of the ground state. That's all the choices well, I just described. And then if you look at there's an ener if you look at some excited state And you ask, well, what the energies are of the excited states over the ground state? Well, these go to zero as uh, I'll go to finish. I say there exist that go to zero. And that's easy to see from this picture because, all right, so the k's in L finite, we have a bunch of states corresponding to the values of k equals 2 pi n over L. And as L goes to infinity, they get very close. And you can see here, so we fill up to here. And then if I just either take one state that's very close in energy to there out, or I add one in, well, then I just decrease the energy by a little. So again, exercise. That's not obvious to you. Check that statement. And in fact, I'll make even a more precise statement. As long as mu is in between, as long as mu over 2 is less than t, then the states are order, the energy is order 1 over L. Actually, another exercise, and then check if, if you don't have any states here. Actually, I can just say this in words, but you can check then if I don't have any states. Sorry, I, I don't have any states in the ground state, so I tune mu so that it's all the way down here. So then the ground state really is all states empty. Well, then it's still gapless, but the energy will be 1 over L squared. And the, a condensed matter person would say this is at band bottom. That's another thing you can check. But I hope, at least to most of you, that's at least reasonably plausible. 
So that looks uh, really simple, and it is. But it's not hard to make it a lot more interesting. So let me do one thing. So this is a real exercise. Those of you who need, are getting credit for that, you do have to do this. So now let's do something relatively simple, but which has a pretty strong effect. So let's stagger the hopping amplitudes. Okay, and so what I mean by that is now I'm going to take my Hamiltonian to be the following. So I'll have my, so first let's just take t real because it's easier and set mu to be zero. So I'm going to take my Hamiltonian to be the following. So if I have, let me, sorry, let me just look to make sure I write it out with the conventions. Right here, yeah. So like I say, I set uh, mu to zero, and just for simplicity, let's take T and S real, although it's not hard to do it in general. So now what this is, notice this is a minus one to the J, so I'm changing the hopping amplitude a little site to site. Or I can change it a lot, I guess, but I'm changing it. So for, a, for S equals zero, just the case I did before, for S non-zero, it's something different. So that means they like to hop more on half the links. And they don't, they like less on the other half. So I again described this, everything I said. can apply. It's just the matrix you have to diagonalize is now a little more complicated. So the matrix will look like this, T plus S, T plus S, but then it's going to alternate as you go down. And I'm, like I said, I'm setting mu to zero. So. And then I've got these guys. I guess that'll be T minus S. So that's a little harder matrix to diagonalize. And so that's the, uh, for those of you who are getting credit for this, you really got to do this one. So compute epsilon, well, you have to, and the eigenvectors. Still not too hard, but it does, took, well, two thirds of a page. Algebra, and I did it a stupid way. So if you're slick, you can do it quicker than that. All right, so that's the exercise. But since uh, I, uh, no, actually, I won't write down the answer, but I'll, I'll, I'll draw the picture because I'm not going to need today the uh, exact answer. I don't think I'll write it out if I need it, but I don't think I'll need it. But I'll draw the picture. And so the picture looks like this. Um, so it starts out looking pretty much the same as you had before. So let's take S smaller than T. So this is for S smaller than T. So it starts out at K equals zero. So this is again, I'm plotting epsilon at K. So it so starts out at k equals 0 down there. But what happens at pi over 2, minus pi over 2, it does this. And it looks like that. And then there's a gap that looks like that. So again, so that gap sound fancy, but literally you'll just get that. So the hint is, you know, you get a quadratic equation and there's two solutions. So that's how you get the discontinuity. 
for s not equal to zero. So you look like that. Okay? And I won't tell you the exact formula. That's the homework because I don't need it, at least not today. So, so here's the thing. So I, meant, I made this point to say that, well, because the other curve looked like this, so I could add a state whose energy just varied by this. But what happens now? So if mu equals zero, so that's mu equals zero. So in the ground state, all those guys are filled because they have negative epsilon k. But in the, um, if I now want to add an excitation, so say I just add in another fermion, or if I want to keep the fermion number the same, I add a fermion, take out. Well, there's some energy here associated with that. And no matter how big I take the system, so this is the definition of a gap, no matter how big I take the system, that's still some finite value, okay? Delta stays finite as all goes to infinity. So thus, it will always take a finite amount of energy. So as long as mu is zero, and for that matter, as long as mu is anywhere in between here, I can change mu, and as long as it doesn't go there, um, So a finite amount of energy, uh, finite as opposed to infinitesimal. So that's kind of cool. And all, like I said, all, you, all that happens is you have to stagger the couplings like that. So you still have translation invariance, although now you have to translate by two sites right, for the system to be invariant. But there's still translation invariance. And again, the fancy way of saying the unit cell is now double. Okay, so that's what happens with that. Uh, and I'll say this is called gapped. And as a parenthetical comment, there's been a splash in the quantum information people because some people proved that the question of gapped versus gaplessness is undecidable. You know, this Turing undecidability stuff. So if anyone knows understands this result, I'd really like to understand it. So that means in general, of course, this, this, this is decidable. It is gapped. <laughs> the other case is gapless. I have decided. I, we, we've calculated. But that proves, you know, in any, uh, in, uh, you know, you can't generically uh, assume that that question is decidable, which sounds like the most bizarre result I've ever heard, um, that, that there, you can write down Hamiltonians, I believe local Hamiltonians, at least that obey some kind of locality, such that this can't be decided and the L goes to infinity limit. This is the strangest result I've ever heard in my life. But anyway, so if someone understands really what's going on there, explain it to me. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe. Okay, yeah, so that's a tangent that I don't even understand. So maybe, yeah, <laughs> maybe some other time I'll understand it and I can lecture about it, but there's people who understand it. Anyway, so yeah, so in this case, however, that was a tangent. Gap versus gapless is a very decidable question, and they mean everything. Okay, so. Hmm? How do I, ha how come? Hopping is possible, but yeah, it, yeah, yeah. I don't, you know how, I just say you compute it. That's why I made it an exercise. That's why you really got to do that exercise. You just literally compute it. So it's saying it's, if you wish, so one intuition is because it's easier. So if you're at half filling as you are, right? So what the happens is they want to hop back and forth between say, you know, sites one and two. Yeah, so I can give some intuition here. So, all right, so we've got our sites, right? And so say we have lots of hopping between, between, so say we've enhanced, so this is T plus S, and then this one's T minus S, okay? So if you think about hopping, there's that minus sign. 
they kind of like to hop. That can lower the energy. At least if they're in the right linear combination, hopping lowers the energy. If you look, if you write out that Fourier transform, maybe that's clear. But so what happens here, so if you're here, notice you filled exactly half the states. So we have one fermion for every two sites. So what happens here is if you make it more desirable for um, it to hop between these two sites, what you'll get is more likely the fermions just prefer to hop back and forth between these two sites. And so you have one fermion for these two sites, um, and so they'll hop back and forth, and then you'll get the same. And it's half filled, and so you have one fermion for the two. So this is an example, I guess, of what Andrea said, of localization. So they, they're, they're happier there. And so that's why to get a fermion to move, to put an excited state, you have to put in some finite amount of energy to overcome this fact there. So that's, yeah. Yeah, well, this is this is one band another. I wrote it like because this is going k to p a lot of times. What people will do, and in fact, if you if you work it out, what you'll see is um, your answer will be invariant under shifts of k to pi. There, like I say, there's a quadratic equation. So a lot of times people will just you know do that, redefine k for the other half of the states to be that. So I, I mean, is that, uh, yeah. So that's yeah, that's the more. I, in fact, internally debated whether I should say that. I thought it would confuse matters more to say it, but anyway, maybe I can use that. So either way, that's the other. That's what people will call the other bad. Yeah. 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 Right. It, it, yeah, if you write out and if you write out these eigenvectors like I did, I mean those are different k. Like I say you can take half the states and redefine k if that's what you want. But if what I mean by k, and that's why I tried to take this viewpoint, I'm not talking about momentum. I'm just talking about a label. Um, and so yeah, I, I, right, well, I think I agree that why well, I did it that way. But, but it, it's fair enough. Uh, sorry, sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, so yeah, well, Ronnie, so Ronnie pointed out an, exp so my, my mathematical comment is really, you know, if you do it the way, the way I drew it, that's really in my setup if you do, do it with these Fourier coefficients, that's what said. And then what Ronnie, well, go ahead. Read. Good. Yeah, good. So, uh, 
a rare time where I actually what I did is the right experimental thing to do as opposed to mathematical uh, mathematical fun. Yeah, I got I got lucky. Yeah, yeah, I got lucky. Uh, usually I would say, oh yeah, the math it, it wor the math works out nicer if you do it this way, even if the physics doesn't. But okay, happy coincidence. All right, so good. That's a step. So let me let me make a few general comments. So again, so this looks kind of simple. It's one e, and uh, but I mentioned at the beginning everything I said. Um, about solving free fermions, the method I outlined is totally general. So, for example, if you write down a uh, hexagonal lattice, hopping, nearest neighbor hopping on the hexagonal lattice, that's graphene, and you find this remarkable thing, just if you diagonalize that matrix like I did, you find that you get these gapless points. So even though it's a two-dimensional, so if you take graphene, uh, a hexagonal lattice, even though you get a two-dimensional um, the system, and so the surface is one-dimensional. So, um, in the Fermi, what we call the Fermi surface here would just be these points. The Fermi surface just labels sort of the top point that gets filled in the ground state. So, in uh, a two-dimensional system, you would have a two-dimensional C, and then in in K space, you have K X and K Y, and then you have a one-dimensional Fermi surface. But then you get cute things like there's points on that Fermi surface which are gapless. In most of everything, save a few points, is gap. So you get all this neat stuff. So, so you get there. And in fact, most of condensed matter physics, what band structure is, is basically you write this stuff down. And on complicated lattices, you get complicated solutions or of that eigenvector equation. And, uh, you know, lots of lots of great stuff happens. So, I mean, that's what, what have occupied many, many physicists for, for decades. And so there's one thing in particular that uh, people have focused on, uh, on recently is the topological properties. So here's the magic word. Remember, that was in the title of... Fermi surface. Well, let's just say the Fermi C. Um, and so, so there is topology having to do with real space. But now that we have this object here, you can ask, well, what happens when I change K around in questions like this? I'm, I'm being very vague now as the lectures go on. We'll, I'll be make all this very precise. And so it may not be surprising you. Well, if you're in higher dimensions, all sorts of interesting stuff. Um, can happen, and in, well, and it does. And one of the things that people have studied a lot recently, go under the name of topological insulators. And so, why I stress this gap versus gaplessness means is you can have free Fermi systems. So you have various free Fermi systems. And so they've, they've got this Fermi surface, this Fermi C. So what I explained is Fermi C, you fill all the levels of negative energy, you leave the ones of positive energy empty. And so when you, when it, um, so what you find when you study these topological insulators is you find, for example, there are different Fermi you find there are different kinds of free Fermi systems. In, in the following sense, you, it's a different kind of Fermi, free Fermi system if it cannot be deformed to another kind. So you have two different kinds. You have kind A and B. So, so kind A, type A and type B are different. So this is the precise definition. If a cannot be to be without closing the gap. And so on the face of it, this is really strange because I wrote everything out in terms of a matrix T. 
Every single thing is just given by that matrix T, whatever you define. Obviously, I can take any Hermitian matrix. I can continuously deform it into another, any other Hermitian matrix that you so desire. But on the other hand, these things are different if I cannot, I guarantee if I deform matrix A into matrix B, I guarantee that I will hit at least one point where the system is gapless. Okay, I cannot do it. And this is because when you look at these matrices, you find they have certain topological properties. And as, if you're familiar with topology, you know, topology has all these invariants. One example being, you know, you wrap a rubber band around a broom handle. I can't continuously deform the number of times I wrap a rubber band around a broom handle to each other without cutting it, taking, or taking it off the broom handle. And so these matrices I wrote down have same properties. And so there's been a ton of work in the last decade or so, maybe 15 years now. And, um, and I'm not going to talk about things uh, in general for sure, but I'll just mention there's this famous classification using some fancy mathematics called K-theory. But so there's a classification in any dimension um, using a fancy math called K theory, which very obviously for a long time had something to do with free Fermi systems and what the more mathematicians call Clifford algebras, which is just this algebra I wrote down. Yeah. The important is, is means I can define the, this problem precisely. I, can, I should say not only define the problem precisely, but then compute things. So, uh, so, so the importance is that this statement I just made that you can classify only applies for free Fermi systems because that's the only case it can be shown to be true. A huge amount of work has been done, and I'll, as the lectures go on, I'll... I'll I'll mention some small parts of this work and what happens um, uh, if you add interactions to the fermions. Well, it, it could be still valid. Right, right. That's a much more difficult statement. So, uh, and there are cases of which, of course, people can prove something. But, uh, but how the classification works, you know, because this is a pretty... Um, dramatic statement. It says, I cannot get, there's no possible way to get from system A to system B without closing the gap. And if they add interactions, it's much harder. It, it may just destroy, it, it conceivably, in fact, naively, you might say, ah, interactions will wreck the whole thing. And I'll give you a very explicit example of that. No, 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 no all I mean. So in, in the statement, so I, I can be very precise in terms of the matrices. So, so I have that matrix there. I have one matrix, you know, I have T sub A and T sub B, the, the matrix I defined at the beginning. So obviously, I can continuously deform one Hermitian matrix into another. I just gradually change all the, all the things, all the things. But what, this, what the, these theorems say, I cannot get from there to there with closing the gaps so for some value no matter how I try to get from this matrix to that matrix any continuous path uh, at least one point on that path you will find a gapless system and and so it maybe it's true for interacting systems but it's just then a much more difficult statement to make because I don't have that simple matrix like I just uh, described a system that has what Spins. Well, everything I wrote down tr applies to spins because all I do is I, uh, I, I write down a different C for uh, the spin up and spin down, say. So if you wish, I said there was a C for each point in the lattice. All right, well, so then I, I, I have two Cs for each point in the lattice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, so, yeah, so, uh, 
there's important, di yeah, well, I'm going to start with this. Well, we'll see. Maybe I can actually, maybe I, if there's enough questions, I can keep delaying and I don't have to start on icing this time. Um, there's some important distinctions, even though there's equivalences between icing and spin systems, but I, uh, I will talk about that a lot, but so let me dodge that. But yeah, no, no, the, there people, you can make similar statements about spin systems, at least a prior. There, that's much more difficult. Yeah. Good. Another question. Um, yeah, well, so in fact, one of the things, yeah, to give a preview of what's ahead, one of the things, um, and even, even in, well, one of the exam one of the things, for example, in some of these systems, you will find things like gapless edge modes. So which can obviously, so you have modes, even though the system is gapped in the bulk, if you put it on a disc, say, for a two-dimensional system, you, you will see gapless edge modes. And that actually, to go ahead, things like that. So what's, what's special about this is some of these systems turn out must have certain interesting behavior. So it goes with, well, so what, well, so this is sort of step zero. This says there's these different kinds of systems, right? So yeah, I make, that's, a, that's true. So then the question is, well, how do you characterize this? And so by, by my mumbling about the word topology means there's some sort of topological invariant. And as I'll try and explain it as these lectures go on, that imply, topological invariants imply lots of interesting things. So edge modes being one of them. And when you, so in, in, so in other words, it's a guarantee of systems of a certain type will have these things. And then on top of that, these edge modes have all sorts of really interesting properties. So that's why, so this is why we're, so this is why this is more, right. So you're asking, well, you know, okay, fine. So wh what do I, you know, yeah I'm, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm often accused of being a mathematician, right? So, okay, math, you know, K theory, woohoo, you know, but the point is then this gives you this list of theories. And then when you know certain kinds of theories, ah, you, you know for a fact that this particular kind of theory must have some certain properties. And for reasons I hope I'll explain in, in detail, those theories are really interesting. And uh, that's why we, we notice these things. So yeah, so, so this is sort of comment zero, just that these, you know, that these things exist. And but like I say, well, we'll get to, we know they must exist, which is really interesting. And that's what this sort of classification tells you, that these theories are there. Good. Any more? Yeah, I'll say I can keep, uh, you know, we can stop. I have a few more general comments to make, so maybe good. Keep asking questions, and I'll make a few more general comments, and then we can stop without my having to start something new. But any? Okay, good. Yeah, I, I can start. I can end a few minutes early, right? Yeah, okay. Um, right, good. Yeah, these questions addressed a lot of the things I wanted to say. Yeah, so, yeah, let me, uh, okay, good, yeah, I know what I, actually, good, I can give a schematic answer to the kind of questions. So this sound, okay, so what I said, so this K theory thing, like I said, works in any dimension, turns out to be periodic mod eight dimensions, so if you're in nine dimensions, it's similar to one dimension, for example, in terms of this classification. Obviously, nine dimensions and one dimension are very different, but, I'm, but when you're looking for the particular kind of invariance that I'm going to describe, not today, but in the lectures to come, uh, those things happen the same as one and nine. And so that says, well, when you get this funny stuff, so 1D looks simple. You know, I've spent most of my career in one plus one dimensions. Um, and you might think everything is totally trivial there. You know, we can solve it, and we can, and we'll solve the icing model next time. But on the other hand, you still get this remarkable physics. And so, you know, there's this great history, and so this is what I'll describe in detail next time, but I think this is good to give a schematic picture. So there's this famous icing model, and then there's a quantum icing chain, which is the 
I'll explain this precisely. If you haven't heard these words before, just take it to some interesting model that's very famous. Probably everyone's at least heard of it, even if you don't know what it is. So if you take a one-dimensional quantum version of the Ising model that I'll describe next time, well, that's got a long history. Again, there's another schultz mattis lieb article that describes very carefully how to solve this. Um, and you can really compute lots and lots of things, a famous illustrious history. But it, there's been this phenomenon in condensed matter physics. In condensed matter physics, you will see models that are mathematically equivalent And by mathematically equivalent, what I mean is there is a mapping from a Hamiltonian here to Hamiltonians involving of free fermions. Meaning there's it's just change around what you call your variables, but they're the identical system. Um, again, this will be next time I'll describe precisely how this goes. But here's the interesting sociological phenomenon. So this has been known again for the first results were in the 40s and it was absolutely clearly understood in completely modern language by the mid 60s. Um, and But nonetheless, condensed matter physicists have renamed this model the Kataev chain. And so the next lecture is going to describe why that is. And I think, well, maybe the naming, renaming something may be a little bit extreme. On the other hand, despite um, people thinking that they understood everything, could I have explained, no, there's actually a really, really interesting piece of physics in the icing chain that people hadn't ever thought about. And so let me just tell you what that is as a preview next time. So, okay, we've got this mathematically equivalence between icing variables, which are spin, it's a spin model, and fermion variables, like I was just describing. So the one catch is this mathematical equivalence, the map from spins to fermions, is non-local. So again, the jordan wigner transformation, I'll define it precisely next time. No one, as far as I know in the literature, and if you've seen it, tell me, no one ever thought to ask the question, well, um, in the spin model, there's an ordered phase when you stick in all the couplings. So in the 2D classical language, you know, so it's spins like to be all up or all down are favored. There's a symmetry spontaneously broken. The spin flip symmetry is spontaneously broken. So a question, Kataev didn't phrase it this way, but you can rephrase what he did by the following question. Well, okay, so we know what an ordered phase is. That's again, ancient history. Now, again, ancient history, you can map this onto free fermions, but no, one really asked, what does spin order turn into in the fermionic language? So in other words, if the fermion, if in the icing your fermions are your actual degrees of freedom, and this is doable experimentally these days. So there's a mathematical equivalence between spins. All right, well, in this spin model, we have an ordered phase. I make the same model using fermions, mathematically identical Hamiltonian. But then the question is, what does spin order mean? The map is non-local, so what does it mean to say the spins are ordered when I've got all these fermions running around? I think people basically before just said, oh, that's a weird question, and uh, well, moved on um, and but so he well I say he didn't even really ask the question but he most definitely answered it and the answer is very clearly topological order and so next lectures I will explain what those words precisely mean good 
So see you on Monday. Oh, don't forget your uh, lunch menus. Or your